welcome um, to our 350 US Utilities Public Education Series. Um, this is our number two session of um, a series that we're going to be holding all summer. Um, at 350, we have to start, we've begun this process of really exploring what it looks like for us to participate in utilities, knowing that it really is one of the main culprits that's really keeping us away from a swift and just transition and one of the biggest contributors to the climate crisis. Um, a part of our exploration has also been recognizing that a lot of people don't really know how to tackle utilities. They don't really know where to start. They don't really know, um, you know who the culprits are, how they can get involved or like how they can actually fight it. So we felt that we really needed to kind of step, take a step back and really focus on education and building out a really strong educational series uh, to make sure that our base is informed and ready to actually plug in and fight. So this is our second session around community run renewables. And we're gonna do some introductions. Um, I'm also gonna be sharing a sneak peek of our, our own power toolkit. Uh, then we'll be introducing our special guest speakers today, doing some breakouts, and then we're gonna have a report back in Q&A. So while folks are getting settled in, I know this is around dinner time for some people or like late afternoon, um, you might be doing this between work calls, um, but just asking that folks remove distractions, grab a beverage or a drink if you'd like to, uh, you know, find whatever you need to do to center yourself. So if you feel more comfortable on the couch, if you need to be off camera, that's totally fine. Um, and also, you know, get your utility bill. Let's take a look at it because there's a lot to be angry about. So my name is Candace. I am the US Campaigns Manager here at 350. And I'm really, really excited again to be working with all of you, uh, learning together about the world of utilities and how we can really fight this system and get to a swift and just transition. And I would like for folks to participate first and foremost in a grounding um, that I'm really curious about, because I think this is pretty much indicative of how we're gonna be thinking about this session today. If folks can just add in the chat, why is community so important? We say community a lot, it's a buzzword, it happens a lot in the organizing spaces, but why is community so important? Why do we, why do we need community? Doris is saying there is power in community versus the individual. It's where we live, support and power together. There's tons of important things that can't be accomplished individually, yes. Community is what helps you get through hard times. There's not a profit motive. It is very lonely to advance our lives alone. Love that. Awesome. So yeah, please keep sharing in the chat. These are really, really great framings. And before we get into our sessions and trainings today, I did want to share with you all a toolkit that is emerging out of 350. That's sort of a starter's guide for folks who are interested in starting to explore what it would look like for them to have their own community run renewables. This is called the Our Own Power Toolkit. And to quote Naomi Klein, uh, we say no to the bad ideas and bad actors. Uh, to say no to the bad ideas and bad actors is simply not enough. The yes is the lighthouse and the storms to come that will prevent us from getting lost. And from a global perspective, uh, as 350 is a cli global climate justice organization, is that we really want to focus on building 1.5 terawatts of solar and wind capacity every year by 2020 to keep us on track for 1.5 degrees to phase out fossil fuels. Uh, the IPCC report um, has already said that solar and wind are the two biggest and cheapest tools in the toolbox to cut emissions this decade. And in 2022, so far, the world has uh, added uh, 295 gigawatts on renewable energy installments. So what we're aiming for is to increase the installed capacity of solar and wind by six times annually. But we also know that increasing it and scaling up presents a risk where we might be putting ourselves in the same hands of the culprits who are putting us in this position with fossil fuel utilities to begin with. Sometimes a swift and just transition might create an appetite for these same fossil fuel investors to kind of exploit this industry and make it something that is not 
sustainable, is not helpful, and is not economically just. So that is why we are trying to focus on community-led power with the Our Own Power Toolkit. And this is a list of our table of contents with the toolkit. Um, one, just how to build a core team. What does your community look like? Um, and how do you identify those folks and get them involved? Um, two is just the research and analysis and what you need to do to even get this on the ground and know how to target it and how to strategize, uh, developing a work plan, how you're gonna implement the plan, and then also expanding access and telling your story. And this is an example tool that comes out of the toolkit. Um, and uh, Taylor's putting in links so that folks can access this on their own time. Um, but there's metrics that we want to suggest for folks whenever they start to kind of ideate what it might look like to have community-run renewables. One is protecting the climate. So um, does that project build on renewable energy that produces effectively zero carbon dioxide in its normal operation? Does this project reduce a lot of carbon uh, dioxide emissions relatively to the size of the group or the effort? The procedural justice have impacted and previously locked out communities had chances to meaningfully participate in this project. Um, does it follow the proper consultation with the impacted communities? Are the front lines really involved? Then there's restorative justice. So does this help right the, the past wrongs? Does this project help provide for the people who are impacted by the climate crisis? There's economic justice as a metric, which is super key. Um, does the ownership of the project and its profits flow away from multinationals towards local communities? You know, are we putting this back into the same sort of like capitalistic big brain infrastructure, or is there some kind of circularity involved that actually uh, sustains the community? And then is this also organizing justice? So does this project provide inspiration uh, likely to result in more projects like it? Uh, does this create like a decentralized network? More people want to get involved. And this scorecard is a really great way for folks to just start to think about what that might mean, what that might look like. Um, you know, you can start to measure what the success or what the potential of the project would be from there. So if folks want to get involved and get more information, um, this toolkit is an iteration from Daniel Hunter, who is um, one of our training managers at 350. Um, if you are interested in learning more information or want to get involved in our network, uh, please sign up on the link in the chat. Um, Daniel will be more than happy to answer your questions, offer some guidance. And again, this is just like kind of a starter toolkit for folks who just kind of want to explore and dream and imagine what it might be like to have community-run renewables. So again, just ourownpower.org. And now I'm going to pass it on to one of our guest speakers. Very, very excited to have him in the building. Uh, the virtual building, that is, uh, Jonathan Welly, uh, who's a lead organizer of uh, Cleveland Owns, who's going to be sharing about uh, building Ohio's first community-owned solar array. So I'll pass it to you, Jonathan. Great. Thanks, Candice. Is my audio coming through? Can you hear me okay? Great. Awesome. All right, everybody. I'm glad to be with you. My name is Jonathan Welly. Like Candice said, I see him pronouns. I'm here with Cleveland Owns in Cleveland, Ohio. And I'm excited to talk about the work that we're doing to build the good, to actually build the version of a utility that we think Clevelanders deserve. Uh, I'm honored to do that today with Sachi, who I'm going to introduce in a minute, uh, who, is, who is doing this in, in Minnesota with a group that we truly admire. And I'm excited to share how some of those threads connect uh, towards this project of not only building solar, but building community-owned solar, deeply democratic. Um, we do this work often under the framework of energy democracy, and I'll start with an example of what we mean by energy democracy. Cleveland Solar Co-op is a member-owned Ohio cooperative association that Cleveland Owns founded uh, a few years ago with this mission of building Ohio's first community-owned solar array. Uh, and we're basically what we think the first member-owned community solar development, excuse me, solar development company in the state of Ohio. Uh, what that means is that when we have profits, those profits would go back to the members. And when we have big decisions to make, it's the members who have the opportunity to make some of those decisions. That's how we classify this as community ownership. Um, and let me tell you about how that fits into the broader set of work that we see at Cleveland Owned. So on the next slide. 
so Cleveland Owns is a, is a nonprofit. We incubate cooperative businesses, and we do this from the perspective of the framework of the just transition from the Climate Justice Alliance uh, with their partners, Movement Generation, who created what I think is a very helpful framework. On one side, we have the things we want to fight, and on the other side, we have the things that we want to build. We want to fight the extractive economic systems that harm our environment and harm our people. And on the other side, we want to build alternatives that are in line with our values of deep democracy, of governance, of taking care of people from a social and emotional perspective. Yeah, and thank you for putting the link in the chat, Taylor. Um, so, you know, we do a couple of things related to that. We really focus on the build the alternative side. Uh, so one project we're going to talk about, of course, is tonight the Cleveland Solar Co-op, a few others. Power Up Purchasing Co-op is a, is a co-op of institutions, nonprofits, in Northeast Ohio and throughout Ohio area who buy things together in bulk, mostly contracts. It's a way to save money. It's a way to find some efficiencies. And most importantly, it's a way to direct the spending that these institutions are already going to do towards more um, socially aligned with their mission enterprises, so mainly locally black and brown owned businesses. Uh, so that's an example of an example of something we're trying to build that's building the good. Uh, another example is People's Budget Cleveland, which is a campaign to get 2% of the city's budget directly into the hands of residents using a tool called participatory budgeting. So I'm just highlighting those kind of a spectrum of things. Today, we're gonna to talk about one of those things that we work on, and that's the Cleveland Solar Co-op. And a little bit more context around how this fits together in a theory of change, thank you. Um, you know, our idea is we wanna build the good. That means specifically equipping workers and neighbors with the tools that they need to launch cooperative businesses. We wanna scale those co-ops, we wanna grow those co-ops, in so doing that workers and the neighbors actually have more power, they have more resources because they've organized their money, they've organized their people. And we wanna instill, uh, basically call it a chamber of commerce, but for the democratic economy. Uh, so we can build some real power and fight the chamber of commerce. Unfortunately, that so often is on the wrong side of important questions in Northeast Ohio. And we wanna have so much power eventually that in a democratic way, these institutions that are representing the good that we wanna build can do audacious things, including, here's a big idea, buying the Cleveland Cavaliers, the professional basketball team in Cleveland, which would be a really bold thing that's gonna require a multi-year campaign. But we wanna envision a Cleveland that is owned by its residents, including the beloved institutions such as the basketball team. Um, so that's, that's why we're doing this work. That's why uh, this work around community-owned solar is important for us as an example of seeing this change in action. Um, so let me describe a little bit more around that and, and one more framing piece on the next slide before we get into what Cleveland Solar Co-op actually does. When we imagine building Ohio's first community-owned solar array, well, that's the, that's the headline. Yeah, that's the fun part. That's the visible part. People can see that. But I'll tell you the real work happens underneath the water and the big part of the iceberg, which is building economic and political power that will allow us to make the shift towards, in this case, call it energy democracy a system where people and communities actually own and control the energy system that they use day to day. Um, you know, I got into this work a quick aside uh, as a volunteer in the Peace Corps, which is a fun connection Sachi and I share. I was in the Dominican Republic, where in a group of women who started a cheese co-op just had a tremendous amount of energy. They were so enthusiastic about what they could do together, what they could build on their own terms in their own way as a way to make ends meet, as a way to build the future that they wanted to see together. Um, that I got really on fire for how co-ops can play a big role in transforming our economic system. And that was about 15 years ago. I've been on a long arc ever since to come back to that. And now I'm doing this in my hometown. I grew up just outside of the city of Cleveland. I've been living in the city proper since 2015 and working on Cleveland Owens for five years. We just celebrated our five-year anniversary on Saturday. Actually, it was really fun. We, had, uh, we went to a big uh, worker co-op in town and had a big party. So that's a little bit about what brings me to this and how Cleveland Solar Co-op fits into this broader picture. Let's talk about what Cleveland Solar Co-op is on the next slide. Um, Cleveland Solar Co-op uses this model called the Commons model, a group that we really admire, admire the People Power Solar Co-op in Oakland, California, helped bring this to our attention and really share the insights behind this model with us. It's a simple idea. It's kind of like crowdfunding, right? People pool their money, we go out and buy some solar panels, put the panels on the roof, that's in number three on this little diagram. 
the host who has the panels on the roof, they see some savings through net metering. Net metering is when you get a discount on your bill because you're generating some of your own power on your roof. That savings comes from the two utilities. One is First Energy, the other is Cleveland Public Power. Cleveland is a unique town because we're served by two utilities, one owned by investors, that's First Energy, large, very corrupt corporate utility. Another owned by the city, which is Cleveland Public Power, smaller, not very high functioning, uh, but still serving about 90,000 households every day. So it's a substantial player. Um, each of them, re regardless of who you have as your electric distribution utility, if you have panels on your roof, you see some discount. We have net metering, which allows that to happen. That's a policy choice. And then you also, as a host in this scenario, you would pay a second bill. Your first bill is smaller because you get the benefits of net metering. Your second bill actually goes back to the co-op who uses it to repay the members. So this idea of pooling some resources in a common, in a common fund in order to make this, this sort of deal happen. Now, one of the reasons we're using this model is because we don't have the policies that enable us to do other things in a bigger way. Uh, we don't have virtual net metering, which is one of those policies that enables community solar. There is a chance that we will get community solar in Ohio. That would be a big win in a Republican held state. Um, that has happened only a few times in the past, if at all. And so we hope that that happens soon. There is a bill that we're, we're really rooting for. Uh, there's also a chance that would happen at the city level. So we can go from zero to two community solar programs so would be transformative for what we're doing. But until that day comes, we're using this model, uh, which is accessible from every state that has net metering. So it's relevant for almost every state in the country. Not all of them have net metering. But anyway, that's the framework of how this works. Let's go to the next slide where we're making good time here. Yeah, so if this goes well, this is what it will look like. This is a, this is a schematic of a building in East Cleveland, which is a 95% black suburb next to the city of Cleveland called East Cleveland. Uh, and severely redlined, severely underinvested neighborhood uh, town. Um, and a local nonprofit called the Cuyahoga County Land Bank is putting some substantial reinvestments into the neighborhood. Starting with this building, you can see a picture over here, it's called the Mickey's Building. Uh, it was a car dealership built in the 40s. There's kind of this wild thing. You can see the glass panes on the second floor. They used to drive like the Buicks up. They can drive up to the second floor and like they parked them in the showroom right next to the glass windows. Kind of bizarre. Uh, it's been empty for 20 years, you know, as the economy tanked and in particular as white flight fled capital from this town. There are many vacant and abandoned buildings. The land bank has purchased this. Um, they put quite a bit of money in. And they're trying to turn this building back into active use specifically for laboratories, for local biotech startups that they think are coming out of Case Western uh, University and the clinic, which is just down the road. I literally like one mile from here, so it's really proximate, but, but a totally other side of the you know, trickle down economic process where there's a lot of that happening over a, a mile away, but just a mile from there, there's severe disinvestment. Anyway, we want to lease the roof of this building, um, and we've written a 75-page power purchase agreement that details the agreement we would make with the host of this building, in this case, the Cuyahoga County Land Bank, to lease the roof, to install solar on the roof, and to allow them to benefit from the net metering policies that would reduce their energy bill. And in return, they would pay a monthly rate for every kilowatt hour that gets generated on their roof. They would pay uh, a rate that's slightly less than what they're paying from their utility now. So I've got some numbers here. We imagine this is about a 70 kilowatt array um, annual production of a little more than 85,000 kilowatt hours. Uh, right now they're paying 13 cents per kilowatt hour. We're expecting the PPA, they'd sign at about 9.45 cents, just some round, some ballpark numbers there. Um, and, you know, we can imagine, let's call it 142 panels. These are, these are you know, in the ballpark stage, we're going to run an RFP to hire an installer and get more precise numbers. But if you can imagine 150, or yeah, so I should say Cleveland Solar Club, right now we have 65 member owners. So 65 people who are interested in being part of this process and actually putting money into to this co-op and being part of the decision making for the co-op. Um, that's what's powerful and that's what's unique about what we're doing at Cleveland Solar Club. So if you can imagine we need to grow our membership from 65 to maybe 150, maybe even 200 member owners who are each going to have the opportunity to invest in the project for as little as $50. 
$50 increments of $50. If you can imagine 150 or 200 of them standing outside of this building, you know, and we're going to get some fancy drone shot of all these people, you know, waving and excited because they literally have built this array together and they actually own it. They have you know, financial and psychological ownership. Um, and here's an example of how the process of getting to that point matters just as much as getting to that point, getting to that moment where the array actually exists. We've got the folks outside. There's the drone shot. Everybody's waving and they're happy. Even before we get there, it's really important that we do this in the right way. And, and here's why. The bill that's in front of the Ohio State House, which would legalize community solar, is a really big deal, really transform our energy landscape. Um, there's a coalition of folks who are advocating for that bill to go through. We're part of that coalition, proud to be part of it. And across the state, there were 50 people who wrote in in support of this bill. So just regular Ohioans who could write a letter, you going through the process to the chair of this house committee who's seeing this bill. And that's great because the more people speak up, the more the you know, legislators feel compelled to act in the people's interests, theoretically. Uh, and of the 50 from across the state, 18 of them came from the member owners of Cleveland Solar Co-op. Right, so we're already doing that pot bottom part of the iceberg. We're building that political and economic power, you know, one step at a time in small steps right now, but meaningful steps that actually get towards this vision, sure enough, of building the solar array, but along the way, building the power that we're going to need to transform our energy system, starting in ways that are small and growing into ways that are larger. What's really cool about tonight's call is that I get to, you know, share a little bit about what we're doing, how we're doing. I hope I didn't go too long. And now I'm excited to pass it to someone who has been far down this road. I'm so excited to introduce um, Sachi Graber. So Sachi is a powerful leader who's been really like, just what they do with corporate energy, which is, is the dream. If things go really well in Cleveland, we're going to be like cooperative energy teachers when we grow up. Let me introduce you to Sachi specifically. Uh, Sachi uses she, they pronouns. And they are the uh, National Partnerships Lead with Cooperative Energy Futures, where they got their start through three years of leadership on the board. Um, Sachi is the founder of Waxwing Consulting LLC, a climate and equity consulting firm. They have prior experience with the Nature Conservancy, uh, the Rocky Mountain Institute, and the U.S. Peace Corps, uh, and holds a BA in physics from Grinnell College and an MS in environmental studies at the University of Michigan. Really excited to introduce you all to Sachi. Gotcha. Thanks so much, Jonathan. That's the kind of introduction you dream about having one day. Um, yes, super excited to dig into this. Um, and I am here on behalf of Cooperative Energy Futures, which is a Minneapolis-based cooperative organization. So much like Jonathan described in Cleveland, um, our members are actually the owners of our cooperative. Um, the members own the solar arrays, the members um, are the board members, the members vote for the board, and the members make the decisions. Um, so this is a really cool and interesting way to try to take some of the power back from utilities and from decision-making bodies that get to decide where we get our power from and what it looks like and how much it costs and, and all of those things, and to really bring control back to our communities. CEF, um, or Cooperative Energy Futures, um, has been around for more than a decade, which is scary. And really our mission is to serve um, BIPOC and low income community members who don't usually have access to solar. So our primary work right now is in community solar gardens. Um, we also do some work in energy efficiency. We're looking at um, kind of building a little bit of a more diverse portfolio, but um, that's where our work is right now. and. Community solar is just so important because not everybody has the choice in our current system. If you are a normal member of a utility or um, customer of a utility, you don't get to choose where your power comes from. You don't necessarily get to choose whether it's coming from a clean energy source or a dirty energy source. And for most of us who don't have the money to put solar panels on our roofs, or maybe whose roofs are under shade trees, or maybe who are renters and don't have control over our roofs, or maybe who live in apartment buildings and don't have control over our roofs. We don't have the same access to some of this technology as people who are homeowners. And so it's really important thinking about kind of that, um, the equity um, framework that Candace shared at the start of the call. It's really important to think about how are we providing access to these resources for all types of members of our community. 
Um, in terms of our history, I think CEF just has such a wonderful founding story. Um, and we can jump to the next slide. We um, were founded by Timothy Denhurter Thomas, whose photo is there. Um, this was like a youth project. A bunch of students at McAllister College in the mid 2000s got mad about the way that the energy system works and decided to form basically the precursor to CEF. Um, they were looking at one of those cycles of how people engage with the energy system. And what they were looking at at that point was energy efficiency. So if you are poor, if you don't have a lot of disp disposable income, you can't afford necessarily to buy new highly energy efficient appliances. You can't afford a heat pump. You can't afford um, to insulate your house. Maybe you can't afford a new efficient boiler system. Um, that means that you pay higher energy bills than your neighbors because your system is less efficient. And by paying higher energy bills than your neighbors, that means you can't save that money, which means the next time something breaks, you still can't invest in a more efficient system. So this is this is a cycle that people get stuck in, right? And the question is, how do we, within the current system that we have, how do we help people get out of it? And so it started with a revolving fund to help homeowners or um, even renters to help them access energy efficient appliances. Um, and then it formed into CEF, starting with energy efficiency and then building out into community solar. Once Jonathan was mentioning community solar gardens are a state policy. Um, the state of Minnesota enabled community solar gardens earlier than many states have. And so in 2014, we started developing community solar gardens that are not a one family solution, right? They're not just solar panels on one person's roof. There's something that can be accessible by everyone. Um, and I'm going to now pull us up to kind of the higher level. I was encouraged tonight to talk about um, community solar in general and some of the considerations that we have when we think about developing community solar. So just to start off with, I want to share this diagram that has five key project processes um, for community solar. We basically talk about early stage in, in a project development is when we're trying to say, okay, where are we going to put the solar panels? Right? What is that cool building in Cleveland that we think can be a great host that can have a great drone shot? Um, where is that? What does it look like? Who owns the building? Um, let's apply to the state to be a community solar garden. Um, we then move into pre-development, which is actually working through the planning and the contracts part of the process. So let's get a lease with the building owner to make sure we have rights to build on the roof. Let's apply to the utility for interconnection to make sure that our system can actually connect to the grid versus just being a bunch of solar panels out in the middle of somewhere with no way to, to connect the energy to the users. And then eventually we get to development and that usually includes three phases for organizations like ours. Um, we think about construction, we think about financing and we think about customer engagement. Um, so jumping forward to the next slide, I'm just gonna kind of highlight four stress points. So places where if you are a brand new community and you're asking, how do I build community solar? These are the parts of the process that are tough. These are the parts of the process where the system is not set up for people like us to have control of our energy. Um, and to start out with, the first one I have is working with utilities. So a really critical part of building community solar or any sort of community energy source is connecting with the grid. If you can't connect into the grid, you can't get your power into the power lines. And that means your power will not get to any of your customers. So to start off with, in most states, you apply to the utility um, before you even start thinking about your garden. In most states, you have to have approval from the state to build a community solar pro project, but first you have to apply to the utility. And so there's all of these financial barriers, right? Before you have approval, before you know you can move forward, you're already paying money to the utility just to say, yes, I'd like to be in the line, please, to interconnect. Then they move you into the study phase. And there are a lot of different types of studies. There are facility studies and um, feasibility studies and system studies. And all of those cost money, right? And all of those are the utility saying, well, it's inconvenient for us to have you connect your system into the grid. So we're going to go through all these hoops to make sure that it's going to work out. 
Okay, so if you get through all the studies and you pass it, then you get to the stage of having a contract. You write a, a contract with the utility that says, yes, the system is going to interconnect. And, you know, in the next X months, the utility will be responsible for basically bringing a wire that can plug into your solar system. That agreement is in the type of legalese that normal people don't necessarily understand. And it comes with a massive investment. Um, we're working with a partner building community solar gardens in the south side of Chicago, and they just got an estimate for an interconnection um, deposit that's $1.3 million. That's not to build the solar. That's not to attract the customers. That's not to do anything other than to get the utility to play nicely. And so this, again, this is the part where like we are fighting the system to make sure that people have access to the choices that they want and to the type of energy that they want. Um, okay, sorry, I'm rambling. That's working with utilities. Um, the next challenge or stress point that I want to flag up is really around project financing. Because again, if we're starting from communities, especially if we're starting from lower income communities, these things are expensive. And the point is that they pay off over 25 years, but in year zero, when you're trying to build a project, it can be tough to get going. Um, so most, met, mm, most commercial projects um, follow the second model that's sort of in that little graph at the top, the orange bar. And that's where you just have somebody with deep pockets, some investor, um, pay the upfront cost of the interconnection and the solar panels and everything else. And then the investor owns the project for the whole 25 years. That means the investor gets all the profit from the project for 25 years. Um, our model is to say, what happens if we don't do that? What happens if we have the community make the investment? Um, and usually we think about three main sources of dollars for that. So the community is putting in some equity via the organization. For us, our members are all basically, um, you have to pay a fee to become a member. It's 25 bucks. It's meant to not be overly burdensome, but it is one way to bring some cash into the organization to put forward as member equity. Um, our members can also be shareholders so they can purchase stock in CEF and they get a return on that stock that they can purchase. Um, then we get project debt. So about 40% of the project usually is debt coming from just, you know, a 10 or 20 year loan. And then the third part of the project comes from tax equity. And that's something you might have heard tossed around with the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, that's basically saying if you invest in something really positive like solar, you get a tax credit. So you don't have to pay as much in taxes when April 15th comes around, um, as you might guess. Uh, small organizations that are based in the community don't usually have massive tax responsibilities. And so there's a complicated process where we usually go out um, and try to find somebody who does have tax liabilities and ask them to be the investor in exchange for getting the tax credits. Um, that's something we can dig in more into after the presentation, but um, it's complicated and it takes a lot of conversations and rubbing elbows with folks who have access to that type of thing. Um, on the next slide, I just wanted to share as a quick example, as we're developing a project, um, you think about where's all that money going? So you have money coming from the tax equity, coming from debt and coming from the organizational equ equity or another type of equity most of it goes to installing the thing, right? Most of it goes to pay for solar panels, to put steel in the ground for the labor for folks who are going to plug all the wires together. But a significant part of it does go to the utility as well as to what are called development fees. So that's saying, right, there's a lot of work. There's probably two years of work that goes into every project and those people have to get paid even though the project isn't live yet. So there are a bunch of upfront um, cash flows that have to be accounted for that, again, the reason that we think we need an organization like CEF is because it's really hard for community members to come up with that kind of cash and just float it for two years until the project can start producing energy. Um, on the next slide, the third project stress point I wanted to highlight is just in construction. Um, this is 
frankly, easier than getting through financing and then working with the utility. Um, but there are a lot of things that happen during construction. And um, from having a, a strong request for proposal process that make, makes sure you get a great contractor working with you, um, thinking about the price to pay that contractor, especially with some federal guidelines requiring um, certain pay levels to qualify for um, various incentives. Um, there's also a lot of supply chain delays that started during COVID and are actually still continuing. So switch gear is an important part of a community solar project. Um, it, it's an important one of the materials that goes into the project itself. And right now switch gear has a 12 to 14 month lag time. So like you kind of have to have all your ducks in a row because if you don't order the switch gear until you're ready to install it, you're going to be sitting on this project that potentially costs millions of dollars and it won't be able to work until you get that piece of equipment delivered. Um, finally, I wanted to just flag subscriber acquisition as the fourth project stress point. Um, Jonathan did a really good job talking about the importance of getting um, community involved and what does that mean and what does that look like and how do we get community excited about electrons flowing through a wire anyway. Um, so I just grabbed two of the, the things we often share as we're working with members um, and working with potential subscribers. Um, one is thinking about customer affordability. Um, what is actually the impact of this project on a customer's pocketbook? The other is thinking about exactly what we're here to discuss, which is community ownership. Um, on the right, that kind of chaotic chart, what that's showing is under a, a normal solar project, a ton of profit goes to some outside investor. And that's some millionaire sitting at some bank or some fund who's just making money by charging you for power. With a cooperative or a community owned system, that profit comes back to the community. So that comes in the form of cheaper electricity rates, dividends that are paid to co-op members, dividends that are paid to stockholders, um, and the ability to reinvest in other projects within the community. So it's kind of, it's this huge conversation that if you imagine just knocking on somebody's door and saying, hey, do you wanna be a member of CEF? Um, there's a lot more to it than that. And that requires really deep relationship building and pretty strong efforts to make sure that we're communicating that information effectively and transparently in a way that helps folks um, see the value. I think I just sped through my whole presentation. Um, I will pass it back over to Candice. Awesome, thank you, thank you. Um, all right, y'all. Um, we would love to extend to the folks who are on this call an opportunity to break out with either Sachi or Jonathan for just like some one-on-one -on -one time, depending on which topic uh, or pre of the presentation you were maybe the most intrigued by or like to learn more about or that you have some questions around. Um, so we see this as a space to just, you know, have a good focused dialogue and some valuable time with some experts in this field um, to just answer any questions that you might have. Um, so we have breakout room one with Sachi around finance planning. Breakout group two, yes. Okay, I love the dancing too. I'd actually would love if each breakout had like their own signature dance. You can make that part of your checklist. Um, and then Jonathan with community organizing and membership development. So um, I'll be sharing the breakouts and you can just select which one you want to join. But I do ask that in each breakout, you um, identify one person to just take notes. And that's just basically how the conversation is going. Any top lines, any discoveries that come out of it, any key themes that you think are like important to kind of pull out that might be good for other folks to, to think around. Um, and then one person to share out. So if we have someone who's extroverted, <laughs> wants to like, you know, integrate the dance or whatever, um, that'd be, that'd be the time, right. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and launch the breakouts. And if you can see here, one is for finance planning and one is for community member organizing. So go on ahead and hop in. We're going to give you guys 30 minutes 
to do deep dives on whichever subject you are most interested in. And then we'll be bringing you guys back around 8.15 EST to share out. Have fun. <laughs>